This is the Jet Aviation Gallery at the National Air and Space Museum just across the mall, and some of you are probably familiar with it. I want to draw your attention today to one particular engine, um, which uh, is this engine, the W1X, and you've seen photographs of it around. It's the jet engine that actually crossed the Atlantic in October 1941 and started off Anglo-American collaboration on the jet engine. It arrived at the Smithsonian from London, so it was it came over, it was returned to the United Kingdom during the war. Um, it returned to the Smithsonian on November 8, 1949. And at the presentation, uh, Frank Whittle, who was chief engineer of the engine, uh, noted that, is that visible? Um, when the W1X first crossed the Atlantic in 1941, it was the starting point of a most intimate technical collaboration between British and American engineers, and from that time on, work continued in parallel in both countries with a completely free interchange of information throughout the war. Um, at the same event, <laughs> the British ambassador, Sir Oliver Franks, similarly asserted um, that the Whittle jet engine as it rests in the Smithsonian will mark not only a chapter in the book of aviation, but a chapter in Anglo-American collaboration and friendship, a long chapter which is still being written as our two countries work together for peace, prosperity, and strength in the democratic world. Uh, the secretary of the Smithsonian, uh, who accepted the engine on behalf of the museum, Dr. Alexander Wetmore, uh, summed up the message that he thought that visitors um, to the Smithsonian would get from seeing the engine. He said, the many persons who see this engine today, tomorrow, and in the years to come will be impressed by it as a symbol of technical accomplishment and of international fraternity. They will find in it a continuing source of inspiration. So the question, um, that I want to discuss briefly today is what was the technical accomplishment that all these people at this event were so keen to emphasize? And what does this obscure technical object have to do with the Tizard mission? Um, so this is what I want to talk about today, uh, the jet engine. This is a technology that Sir Henry Tizard is not generally associated with, but he was a crucial proponent of. Um, as well as a technology in which the importance of Anglo-American collaboration is also not well known, um, but was similarly important. The jet engine, although not important to combat during the Second World War, was a technology that built on the foundations for collaboration, the links of mutual trust um, that were established by the Tizard mission in 1940. These foundations enabled the creation of bonds of trust that led to, um, indeed that required, future collaborations in other areas as well. So there are three things that I want to outline today. First of all, Tizard's involvement in the jet engine. Um, second, briefly, jet engine development in Britain, um, or the status of it. And third, which I want to spend the most time on, Anglo-American collaboration in early jet engine development. Although Tizard was involved with jet engine, with jet engine from its beginnings, so i.e. in the 1930s, Britain's jet engine policy only took shape later on. So although the engine was revealed by the Tizard mission, it was only discussed in its broadest outlines because the British government hadn't yet decided what it was going to do with the jet engine, or indeed what, it, what could be done with it. Um, Tizard uh, was very convinced about the jet engine's importance to the war effort, so he, he made a good proselytizer in the mission. <coughs> Details about the engine were actually exchanged only later in October 1941. Although the exchange of details occurred later, the jet engine fits well into the pattern of technologies that Britain thought the United States could help it with in 1940. And, and we can see, if we look at it also, a change in an understanding of the technology. So Tizard himself exclaimed in 1940 that, that the jet engine was a production prospect. Um, so indeed, in 1940, when the jet engine is first discussed, Britain is looking to the United States to help in producing the jet engine. But when it turns out that the technology is less developed than previously thought, the United States is looked to for help with development. Um, and where they place the engine with General Electric reflects that. <coughs> so while he was rector of Imperial College from 1929 to 1942, Tizard certainly knew about the jet engine, and he encouraged work on jet engines in England um, at the two places where it first began, both at Power Jets, a private company at this point, and at a government research institution, the Royal Aircraft Establishment, um, depicted here. Um, as president of the Aeronautical Research Council in Britain throughout the war, um, which was an honorary advisory position, Tizard was 
aware of all of the latest aeronautical developments in Britain, as well as being in a position to influence um, how they were developed in the future. So Tizard became a crucial architect, actually, of Britain's jet engine program. Um, throughout, we see his insistence that the jet engine for, should be developed quickly, um, as soon as possible, um, for the war effort. So what's the state of British jet engine development in October 1941, when Anglo-American collaboration on the jet engine begins? In Britain, the jet engine design selected by the British Air Ministry, indeed in 1940, the W2B, uh, was being developed, but had not yet flown. The engine was proving unreliable and unable to produce the thrust that it had been designed for. Indeed, this was the thrust needed to propel the airframe that it had been designed for it, which you may have seen a model of outside the Gloucester uh, E-28. Um, so this is an experimental aircraft. So we can see Tizard's influence everywhere um, in how the jet engine is further developed in Britain. So first of all, in the involvement of all of the aeronautical engine industry in Britain, um, but more importantly and more following Tizard's own speciality, how he thinks that information about this wholly new technology should be most effectively used, and that's collaboratively. The British program was characterized by a very high degree of cooperation, which was intended to speed development. Um, this was formalized in the Gas Turbine Collaboration Committee, as it was called, um, which was established in Britain in November 1941. Um, and this is a photograph of one of the meetings in May 1942. Um, and indeed, um, the, this is a, a picture of a somewhat later meeting of the same committee. It continues for a very long time, even after the war. Um, this committee, the Gas Turbine Collaboration Committee, is dedicated to sharing information among all of the participants in Britain, uh, fully consonant with the British government's expressed desire for the rapid development and production of gas turbine engines. The participating firms indeed submitted prog monthly progress reports, um, which were shared among all of the participants, and problems that were facing all of the committee's members were then addressed in subcommittees. In contrast with the government's competitive piston engine policy then, um, which was that each company should develop its own engines and the government would choose the best one. Its gas turbine policy was one of a mutual and free interchange of ideas. So this, this was a new way of, of technical development. So this committee um, gets set up around the time that the United States gets access to Britain's designs for the W2B engine, um, which arrives in the United States in October 1941, um, along with an engine, the W1X, uh, as I mentioned before. Um, and three British, British engineers supposedly unhappily uh, transported in the bomb bay of an aircraft <laughs> from Britain. <laughs> um, so, so the engine is in pieces. It goes to General Electric Supercharger Division in Lynn, um, which had been selected by the Army and the Navy to produce the engine. So as I mentioned before, it quickly becomes clear that the W2B engine design requires further development. Um, consider the fact that the drawings are sent from the British company that's still struggling to bring the engine into large-scale production into 1941-1942. And indeed, the engine hadn't even flown in Britain. Um, it flies for the first time in June 1943 and actually flies earlier in the United States in October 1942, um, which is a source of some discontent. Um, the chief of the materiel division of the uh, air staff in the United States writes to General Electric in July 1943 admitting that although the development has been somewhat slower than hoped for originally, it is appreciated that the original drawings did not represent an operable engine and much engineering has been required to reach the present stage symbolized by the type I-16 engine, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. What I want to emphasize is what happened around this engine was real technical collaboration. So it wasn't just a copying, um, it wasn't producing a British design. Um, the type I engine, um, which General Electric produced first, was not a copy, certainly, of the W1X, as you can see just through uh, quick visual inspection, but it did certainly bear resemblance, as you can see, to the W2B design, um, which, however, is not yet in production in Britain in late 1941, when the designs were exchanged. So the Type I-16 engine um, indicated here, which General Electric produced before the end of the war, um, developing the W2B further, was particularly important for General Electric because they felt that it was the first engine to contain their own major design features. So again, this, this wasn't a copy. Um, drawings of and data indeed from this engine were given back to Britain in 1943, suggesting that they did think that they had something um, they could learn from the United States. 
Um, we see also the equality of British and uh, American engineers. If we look at the collaboration committee that I described before, American jet engine and gas turbine development is consistently represented at the committee through progress reports that are sent to Britain. Um, they're actually better informed than, than other American projects. Um, representatives from the Army Air Forces and the Navy are present at some committee meetings in person. Um, the NACA, Special Committee on Jet Propulsion in the United States, also includes representatives from the Air Force and the Navy, providing a further direct link between the work being overseen by the NACA in America and the Collaboration Committee in Britain. So I could certainly, I could elaborate on, on the details of this development further. Needless to say, information, engines, engineers, airframes, and turbojet engine parts are all crossing the Atlantic between 1941 and 1945. Um, so just uh, one example. <coughs> uh, the first American jet airframe, the Bell, the Bell XB-59A, which you can see hanging in the Smithsonian, um, powered by General Electric's engines, is sent in late 1943 to the Royal Aircraft Establishment in Britain. The first production uh, Meteor Mark I with Welland engines uh, produced by Rolls-Royce. So Britain's first uh, jet fighter is sent similarly for testing in the United States um, in exchange. So we can see here, I think, how closely linked the British and American national jet programs uh, became. In a sense, this was a development of the early Tizard mission model of technical exchange, which we've already seen. Um, but unlike the Tizard mission, which was so successful in part because Britain was willing to engage in a one-sided supply of information, in the case of the jet engine, Tizard was um, in favor of a full reciprocal exchange of information. So in part, this had to do with the fact that he felt the Americans had gained knowledge through their development of turbo superchargers, uh, which could benefit Britain's development efforts. <coughs> um, and overcoming technical chauvinism, um, as we've heard, was a key contribution um, of the mission and particularly crucial here because Tizard wants the jet to be developed as quickly as possible. So the development of the jet engine in Britain and then the United States in part took place um, in large part as Tizard had envisioned it. So with the country's best brains working together to crack the problem and with collaboration with the parallel development in the United States. Uh, the Commonwealth nations are given information about the jet engine soon after it was given to the United States um, and Canada starts its own government um, overseen uh, program to develop the jet engine. Um, another point of collaboration was cold weather testing, for example. Uh, which was carried out in collaboration with Canada. Of course, there are very cold temperatures at the high altitudes uh, where jet engines operated. Um, and this, as you can see, is a collaboration that continues um, to this day, uh, although in the private sector. This is an ice testing facility opened actually in 2010, um, a joint venture between an American and British company in Canada. Collaboration around the jet engine followed then uh, a tradition of sharing in place since the Tizard mission. But collaboration on the jet engine went beyond collaboration in other spheres because of the frankness of exchange and because it took place so early in the development of what was a really novel technology. So I think the technical collaboration that occurred around jet engines during the Second World War was in important ways constitutive of Anglo-American relations in other spheres during and after the war. The development, for example, led also to a joint jet publicity policy about how the engine and when the engine should be revealed publicly um, a policy that was agreed to by both countries. And the trust that was built then through engineering collaboration um, is developed further. Uh, technical collaboration on this technology then paved the way for further political collaboration, um, even if the parties didn't always agree. The UK sold engines, for example, to the Soviet Union, uh, which the government wasn't particularly, the American government wasn't particularly happy about, but they kept talking to each other. <laughs> So I think we can say the Tizard mission, although it didn't transfer any details of jet engine technology, it opened up channels of communication for technical development um, and later political developments, which later came into play uh, to do with jet engines and other technologies. So it was a key element, uh, a key event in forging the alliance between the United States um, and the United Kingdom uh, and its Commonwealth. The importance of technological collaboration to forging a spirit of Anglo-American solidarity during the war is notable if rarely commented on, and we certainly know that aviation technology was a key area in which it blossomed.